Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring macabre murders and poisoning cases from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 54. I, I'm I'm going with season two, episode two. No, I'm going with episode 54. I don't like it. I think it's we've done 54 <laughs> episodes. I'm proud. Fine, maybe. Mm. <laughs> it, how are you, Nick? I'm all right. I've... Got a gin, got a gin. <laughs> got oh, it's one of those episodes. Got another cocktail coming. Well, it's not my episode. I can get pissed. <laughs> exactly, yes. I have a gin because it's it's bit... Mama's had a day. Oh. Mama's had a day. <laughs> it's all right. It's been fine. It's just been busy. We end up going, oh, 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 the tyranny of life. You've actually had to do some work. It's a terrible, terrible thing. Well, oh, I'm sorry that I work many millions of hours a week. Yes, because I live a life of luxury and I... You do. Swan about, swan on, about. My, on my yacht. <laughs> As we've established, your job is to test how lovely the sofas are that every is, day. That is true. That is my <laughs> only job. I compare sofas. I, I get there on my penny farthing. I obviously stop by the cheesemonger and haberdasher <laughs> on the way. Um, <laughs> test some sofas and then go to my club. Um, where I sit with a brandy. And it's a horrible, horrible life. It is need. a hard, hard, difficult, unpleasant life. Whereas I just open my front door and just go, marketing, and then close it. That's what all marketing is, surely. Whew. Just blow some fairy dust <laughs> into a meeting room and then waltz out going, nailed it. <laughs> uh, well, any poisonings this week? No, no. No. It's again, so it's quite, still quite quiet out there, but things are starting to ramp up a bit. So I'm expecting the poisons to kick in any day now. So when you say things are starting to ramp up a bit. Well, I mean, there's more people around. The people are venturing out more. Say so kids are back back at school. There's more people on the streets, more people on the roads. Just more people who can incur Nick's wrath. They, the percentages exactly. are up, so, aren't they? Precisely. <laughs> so at the moment, is so far it's been quite quiet, mm. quite sort of low wrath levels. Um, <laughs> but more people will only increase the level of wrath until the inevitable happens. Well, that, well that's nice. Well, well, well. Speaking of increased wrath levels and uh, people <laughs> on the streets, I think it's time for us to thank our lovely Patreon subscribers. <laughs> Yes, well, thank you so much to Darling People. Thank you to Susan. And thank you to Mel Laos. Marvellous. You're delightful people. Very, very sexy. You're in for a treat. So much exciting stuff on Patreon. There is. It was fun this week as well, as we established that Sinead would believe anything anyone tells her about her allergies. <laughs> Listen to Patreon this week if you haven't. Uh, if, you, if you're not a subscriber, now's the time to do it so you'll understand what the people fuck we're talking about. People out there defending you. Defending. No, a cheesemonger came on and read to write, no, everything you have said is a lie. <laughs> The, the holes in Swiss cheese are not made by hay. No, you are the only person in the history of the world who has ever thought that. Because the other person who told me it said it was such conviction. I was like, oh, that's interesting. OK, OK, fair enough. Not a moment nice. of questioning from me. Just there we go. So which, which is just what makes me such a good murder podcast host. I believe everything. I would just not let everyone off of what they said. <laughs> well, thank you, lovely, very sexy Patreon subscribers. And if any of you aren't a Patreon subscriber, what the hell are you doing with your lives? That is true. Yes. Well, Nick. Yes. Are you ready? Mm. To drink cocktails and talk about poison? I quite fancy a cocktail. I could go with that. Ooh. Or... We could drink poison and talk about cocktails. No, I would say the, the wrath is not there just yet. So <laughs> I think we need to leave it perhaps a couple of weeks, maybe even a month or so before we get to that level of death. We'll go with the first one. So let's go. I'm going to go with a drink today. I th I'm, I'm very curious to see what your mood is like. The, the week after lockdown eases to the point where we can all meet up and there can be drinks and it will be Nick's euphoria jollity and happiness all around and then week by week it will dip and dip and oh, dip go, absolutely. <laughs> into go death between, my god there are other people here <laughs> bastards why are they here everyone go home leave me alone there are people in so the park I, so yeah so the euphoria will not last long okay maybe i'll give it 40 minutes <laughs> well while we have it while we have it it's time for so we're going to go with the first one we're going to tell a story but of course we can't we can't we can't possibly tell a story without a cocktail in hand as you know every week we pick a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell and will flavor our cocktail my story this week so i got to choose the secret ingredient and the secret ingredient is copper Yes. <laughs> interesting one. Interesting one. It has to be said. Yes, I thought that was intriguing. It is. A, ah. It's. It's an element. It is. It's. It's. It's there. It's metally. It's metally. It's uh, full of metally goodness. Yep. It goes green. So with copper as your uh, ingredient or inspiration, yep. what indeed have yep. you come up with, Nick? Well, 
I you have a, I have a feeling you may well hate me for this. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is it just that you put chartreuse in a bowl and went, it's copper, and then yelled? Yeah, chartreuse is green. <laughs> copper goes green. <laughs> well, that would work. I would see. I yeah, would believe absolutely. you. It's the hay thing. I would believe you. <laughs> I've made a new cocktail called the Verdigris. <laughs> what, have you? Full of chartreuse. No. Oh, okay. But it's a really good idea. So I've just thought of that. That's a fucking good idea. That's a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. Trademark. 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 Um, trademark. It's mine copyright <laughs> so i haven't done any of that brilliant idea. none of that brilliant idea what instead have you come up instead, with instead we are going to have a classic oh classic we're going to have a bit of vodka we haven't had vodka in quite some time we haven't and i do like a vodka we're going to have a moscow mule a mo- well great i love a moscow mule but what copper <laughs> copper yes. and moscow mule have you have you not looked in the bag that I gave you? No. Ah, uh, you will have to see. I'm afraid now. <laughs> I, I have, Sinead has received a bag of things for the cocktail. So <laughs> Yes, it was a bag this week rather than a yes, bottle. Yes, indeed. So as soon as you open that, all will become clear and we shall wait for your exclamations of surprise. It's not like return. a copperhead snake or something, is it? That's just going to jump out of the bag and kill me and then you're going to take the podcast for yourself it's not a surprise anymore <laughs> <laughs> okay well a moscow mule G- great cocktail great oh i'm excited for that so nick has delivered me my sack this week of secret <laughs> ingredients so it's time for us to go into our isolation kitchens and shake up a storm so we'll see you in a minute we'll see you in a bit And we're back. Oh, hello. So a Moscow mule, Nick. Moscow mule. Oh, and it all becomes clear. <laughs> Does it? Did you peek into the bag of wonder? Peeked into the sack of wonder. That doesn't sound right. And what, <laughs> lo and behold, what do we find inside? What do we find inside, Nick? We have a very traditional Moscow mule receptacle. Mm. The copper tankard, the copper mug. <laughs> The copper tankard. Oh, you are really, really pushing it now, Nick. <laughs> well, I think that I thought that was I thought that was inspired. That was because <laughs> Moscow mules have to be served in a beaten copper mug. It's the, it's the way they go. I will let you get away with it, for it is a thing of beauty. It is well, very kind. pretty, and it doesn't surprise me at all that you have very beautiful mugs. <laughs> I'm very pleased. This is the first time I've actually used them. Yay! Because my brother bought them for me for Christmas. Okay, cool. So, um, well, I sort of know what's in this one, but... Sh- Every- I mean, everyone knows Every- what's Everyone knows. Mosquito, and also, I've opened the bag of wonder with ingredients fell out and a cup, and you just go, <laughs> you do it! Yes, so let's have a taste, as is tradition. Mm, Dive in. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheers, mm. cheers, cheers. Mmm, tasty. Tasty. I mean, that's just good. I mean, it's, it's, it's a oh. classic for a reason, isn't it? It's a... Yeah, I have not had a Moscow mule in many oh, years. a long time. Yeah. It's lovely. The, the, fa- the really fieriness good. of the ginger beer and the sweetness and the sharpness. But talk us through it, Nick. So, yeah. So, so for completeness sake, we have vodka, oui. lime, a drop of sugar and topped up with ginger beer um, all over lots and lots of crushed ice. Um, making it very, very, very cold. Mm. You get a marvellously sort of condensation thing going on outside the glass or the mug. And it's a nice long drink as well, because a lot of the ones we do are very short, sharp, mm. really boozy cocktails. Yeah. But this is, this is quite different. It's got a couple of shots of vodka in, but that's it. Yeah. Um, everything else is non-alcoholic, so it's not one that's going to get you plastered within three sips. Oh, it's not what I signed up for. <laughs> <laughs> if you make 12 of them, then yes, you will. Which um, I will do now, because now I have a, a whole <laughs> bottle of Jamaican ginger beer, so I'm either going to boil a ham, or I'm going to make more of these Moscow mules. Oh, God, after a couple I... of the Moscow mules, I'll be like, let's boil a ham. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there's not a huge amount to say about it. You know, unlike last week's cocktail <laughs> rambling, which for about four hours <laughs> yeah people have a nice simple easy one to knock up on a friday night but again in my youth there was a period of time where smirnoff other vodka brands are available produced the bottle the alcopot bottles of moscow mule and i went through a let's say a season to make it sound glamorous rather than a few months down the pub of just <laughs> drinking those solely because they're they're a little bit bitter but a little bit of sweetness in there and delicious so yeah it's been ages since i've had a moscow mule and it's very beautiful i must <laughs> confess it is. I have made it perfectly in a way. 
that when you said crushed <laughs> ice away. and then off air then nick was like i'm just gonna you know bash mine up with a with a not a hammer <laughs> a rolling pin and i was like no 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 i shall use my new blender my new blender is powerful and it can i can make crushed ice with it it's like yay and put in some ice cubes and i underestimated how powerful it that blender is is or is it just liquid ice i've topped it up with snow is what i've done <laughs> <laughs> just literally pressed it for two seconds like jesus christ oh god <laughs> so um yeah but it, it made it very beautiful so a nice crushed ice it's all delicious some of us aren't that fancy fancy blenders no we have tea towels and rolling pins <laughs> it's probably less noise it <laughs> than the blender that i have which is just when you put it on it's like the jaws of hell opening and closing very quickly <laughs> moscow mule delicious with copper actually you know mm. what it's what? particularly apt it works it? the receptacle works okay i'm just gonna leave that there so I'm, I'm imagining there's some sort of copper copper vat or something involved in our upcoming story well nick. or perhaps death death by moscow mules i don't know but with our moscow mules firmly firmly in hand is it time for a story i should bloody well hope so <laughs> well it is my story this week so gather round, children gather round the gramophone while i take you on a journey off to the victorian era for a story of bickering bitchiness and bones we like a bit of bickering bitchiness we're good at that we do we do nick it is january 1879 we are off to the home of mrs julia martha thomas how very civilized she is a widow of around 54 years of age and a former school teacher living in number two mayfield cottage in park road richmond richmond is a lovely is a very oh a fancy place richmond it's a it is now it is very 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 fancy very very beautiful and gentrified back then still pretty pretty nice but not as yeah, fairly fancy, not as dense back then, a little bit well, more rural. Nowhere was. Pretty pleasant area on the outskirts of London. So you've got this this cottage, and uh, the good thing about it is, you know, you're out, you've got lovely countryside, but also you're right next to the Hole in the Wall pub. What more could you ask? Exactly. That's my idea of heaven. Yeah. That's what I look for in every Airbnb. Pub, countryside, and cottagey, just vaguely a roof over my head. <laughs> Now, Mrs. Thomas is lower middle class, let's call her. Someone who who, who takes care of herself. She's she's single now. If she wasn't actually the wealthiest woman in town by a long stretch, she was quite happy giving the impression of her being fabulously well off and refined. She is a woman who's very fond of dressing up into her finery and wearing all her finest jewels and her jaunts around the town. Sounds like you and I. Very much so. She travels frequently. She just goes off on her jaunts for weeks at a time and is described as being somewhat eccentric with an excitable temperament. Nice. It's basically us <laughs> on one of our Saturday jaunts. Getting dressed up in refinery and going about town. Now, a woman of means like this obviously couldn't be expected to take care of her own house and her many fabulous hats by herself. No, 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 no. She required a live-in servant to cook and clean and dust her many doilies. In reality, she probably did not need a servant. Uh, The house was quite small, but she wanted to appear every bit the lady of the manor. The small two-story semi-detached manor, but it's still a manor nonetheless. Well, absolutely. Mrs Thomas has a reputation for being a little bit of a difficult employer, a little bit interfering. You know, she wants things done in a particular way. She's not afraid to talk about it and tell the servants that. And she's either fired many servants Servants or had them walk out in, on her in previous years due to her erratic behaviour. But it just so happened that someone was able to recommend a very good servant who had done a couple of months service for them covering from their previous servant who was unwell. And they said, this person, this person would be perfect for you. This person's name was Kate Webster. Now, Kate was a fine, strong woman in her 30s from County Wexford, originally in mm. Ireland. 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 Uh. She's described as tall, despite the fact she's only five foot five. Okay. I think mainly they were expecting like leprechauns to come from Ireland. So she's, <laughs> she's tall for an Irish woman. <laughs> yes. In those days, they'd never seen such a woman so tall. But yes, she, she's permanently described as tall, robust, strong. Also described at one point, uh, she had a sallow, much freckled complexion and large, prominent teeth. <laughs> so that's what you want people to notice. My large, prominent teeth. <laughs> now, Mrs. Thomas was suitably impressed by this able-bodied woman and hired her immediately on the spot. But back then, references, hmm, let's say they were confined at most to a single letter from a former employer, if you're lucky. Yeah. Or maybe a friend just shoving a servant vaguely in your direction is basically what constituted a reference back then. <laughs> but had Mrs. Thomas tried to dig a little deeper 
she might have uncovered information about Kate that would have made her think twice about taking her into her home. Uh. <laughs> So back in Ireland, even as a child, Kate had a penchant for crime. That makes it sound terribly fancy. It really does, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's me writing, oh, penchant for crime. That's very, very good. She was a thief. That's it. As a small child, she was caught stealing on numerous occasions, taking anything that she could from friends and strangers alike, and was frequently in trouble for it. Well, in her teens, she stole enough money to sail to Liverpool, where she started to eke out a living stealing on the streets by all accounts she was rubbish at it she <laughs> she was a pickpocket and she was caught many 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 times uh, that's less good i don't know what she was trying to do look over there shoving people to the ground and then taking or was their... she just actually trying to steal people's pockets <laughs> not the contents of people's pockets just their, their actual pockets and people noticed this she just happening. didn't understand it she was like this will make a fine coat i just need enough pockets to get exactly. me through to retirement stealing all the pockets i can make a nice pair of trousers myself yes well she, she was she was pretty shit at it on one occasion she was caught and spent four years in prison mm. for theft uh, starting a sentence when she was just 18 so not very good yeah after getting out of jail obviously she travels to london where she gets work as a charwoman jolly we all know what a charwoman is scrubby 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 cleany clean yeah not overly glamorous <laughs> that's in their job description isn't it scrubby 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 cleany 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 well, that's what that that's what they have to say as they're doing it <laughs> and they also get their appraisal each month going okay there was a lot of scrubby scrubby but not a lot of cleany cleany you need to step up your game <laughs> absolutely <laughs> <laughs> but yes yeah, she works as a charwoman in london very much stealing whatever she could on her daily chores from whoever employed her and making a little money on the side it said as a prostitute <laughs> <laughs> just on the side as a prostitute <laughs> on the side whatever i find i keep <laughs> She would later claim that she had married a sea captain and had had several children with him, but they all died. Right. Tragic backstory. Yeah. While living in Hammersmith, she did in fact have one son through her side profession, it is rumoured. She named three different men at different times as the father, one of whom was called Strong. Mr. Mr. Strong. Mr. Strong. Yes, and he was the one who forced her into a life of crime, apparently. Um. Yes, it's, she's going through the Mr. Men, basically. <laughs> Mr. Strong, Mr. Tickle, he was great. <laughs> but becoming a mother, even though she seemed to have affection for the child, did nothing to calm down her crazy ways. And she continued to rob the boarding houses she stayed in and the employers who were stupid enough to let her into their homes, right, left and centre. She would use different names and aliases all over town. She would take a room in a boarding house and as soon as she was inside, she would sell all of the furniture in there before <laughs> running away. Nice. I like it. Just out the window, bringing people around, strip the place, run, Brilliant. run. She's not very good at it, as I've ah. said. This behaviour resulted in multiple short prison sentences, in and out of prison constantly. <laughs> her son, in the meantime, is looked after by a friend of hers during her many spells inside, basically raised by this friend. And she still goes to see him, but um, she's obviously got her mind set on her terrible, terrible career. <laughs> But it was in January 1879 that she was looking for a new post as a servant, having left her last post with uh, the Mitchell family because they apparently didn't have anything worth stealing. <laughs> OK. But she happens to stand in for a servant friend of hers who falls ill. She goes to the house to cover their work. And that is what leads the people of the house to recommend her as a possible live-in maid for the widow Thomas. Uh... Why, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's based on a very short placement that she had with, with this employer and hadn't got round to stealing yeah. anything yet. I don't know. But but widow Thomas, when she hears about her and, and meets her, she hires her on the spot. Like, okay, well, you look a bit mad and you have a carriage clock stuck down your bra. You're hired! <laughs> I like your moxie. In Kate Webster goes to Mrs Thomas's little cottage in Richmond. And at first, it's a, a decent enough position. It's not hard mm. work. It should be fairly simple, these two women living together. But it's not long before the two women take a dislike to each other. Uh, mm. yes. Mrs. Thomas is very critical of her maid's work, following her around and criticising the quality of her cleaning. And Kate later said, should I do this in an Irish accent? I think you probably should. <laughs> it's going to be a southern Irish accent, actually. No. Oh, uh. Jesus. Okay. At first, I taught her a nice old lady. But then I found her very trying. She used to do many things to annoy me during my work. It was going very Belfast here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is rather. When I had finished my work in the rooms, she used to go over it again after me and point out places where she said I did not clean and showing evidence of a nasty spirit towards me. 
kind of what employers are supposed to do. Well, yeah, I think. absolutely. Yeah, so sort of not enough cleany cleany going on. So, it's it was like it many things to annoy me during my work. I would class that more as singing loudly in your ear or <laughs> throwing potatoes at you. <laughs> I mean, that would be annoying, and that would be grounds this is, for this complaint. This is true, yes. <laughs> but uh, no, the old lady was just a stickler for detail. And, and remember, she hasn't been the most beloved of employers beforehand, either firing her staff or she's a nitpicker, definitely. An eccentric nitpicker in fantastic jewellery, but <laughs> nitpicker nonetheless. But apparently Mrs. Thomas didn't approve of Kate's frequent trips to the local pub. There's one right next door. Oh, yeah, yeah. The temptation is too strong, and Kate liked it there. Oh, she did. <laughs> we like the pub. We do like the pubs. So she's going to the pub a lot. She's not really cleaning well, probably because she's hammered. But Mrs. Thomas starts to feel fearful of Kate, and she asks friends to stay with her, implores them to stay over because she doesn't like to be alone in the house with the servant. Mm. So after about one month's service, Mrs. Thomas finally felt enough was enough. It's, you know, you're drunk half the time and where is all of my furniture? Kate was <laughs> given notice to leave and she had to leave her job on the 28th of February. When her last day of employment came, a Friday, Kate was desperate because she had secured no other employment and no other lodging. So she mm. pleaded and pleaded with Mrs. Thomas to give her the weekend just to find new lodgings. And Mrs. Thomas reluctantly agrees. Saturday comes and goes, no sign of any other employment. On Sunday morning, Mrs. Thomas makes her first trip to church because church is an all-day thing. Well, yeah, absolutely. So she goes to the morning service while Kate stays at home, most likely nursing a hangover, but <laughs> fretting about what is she going to do next. She decided she's got to go out. She's going to get herself sorted. She's going to pay a visit to her son who's staying with a friend, and then she's going to get straight on with going to the pub and having a few Sunday sharpness. Absolutely. Needs to be done. Drinking will help her think. Definitely. Always does me. So, of course, hours go by. The sun is slowly setting in the background. She staggers home in the late afternoon, early evening, just in time to see Mrs. Thomas, who has been home, hoping that this woman would have left. She comes back. She's still drunk. And Mrs. Thomas is just heading out for the evening service of church. <laughs> She's a devout lady, has to be said. She's a widow and alone. She hasn't got a lot to do. There's not much else going on. <laughs> no. I think she also likes to make a show. Said, Look at my fabulous dresses. But she's heading out to church and she's very agitated and nervous. People at the congregation comment on it that she seems very upset because she's expected Kate to be gone by now. Mm. But now she thinks the woman's in her home at the 11th hour, possibly pilfering the silver. So Mrs. Thomas hurries home from church early. And what happened next... Kate would later describe, we had an argument that ripened into a quarrel. <laughs> Enjoy a, a ripened <laughs> argument. An argument that ripened into a quarrel, that ripened into a fight, that ripened into a spat. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Thomas came home to a quiet house. She goes up to her room and it's where she's taking off her fabulous Sunday hat. <laughs> that Kate appeared and ran in and at her with an axe. Oh. And strikes her over the head. That's a dramatic twist. I was not expecting that, I must admit. We'll go, we'll Do you go. think she ran in with... <laughs> well, I don't know. I was in it with a doily or something or a <laughs> scrubbing brush. We have Kate's testimony later on, but she runs in, strikes her with an axe. The blow does not kill the woman and the pair begin to fight. And Kate's own words later on were, In the height of my anger and rage, I threw her from the top of the stairs to the ground floor. She had a heavy fall. I felt she was seriously injured. And I became agitated at what had happened, lost all control of myself and prevented her from screaming or getting me into trouble. I caught her by the throat and in the struggle choked her. Ooh. Well, that'll do it. So Kate throttles Mrs. Thomas to death. Ooh. There are other reports that Kate finally finished off the woman with another axe blow to the head. Nice. How jolly. <laughs> you wanted to branch out from poisoning. Well, this, this is true. I didn't, I didn't expect you to go straight in for axe murderer, I have to say. Oh, Nick, if you think that was the worst part of the story. Oh, God, okay. Brace yourself. <laughs> the the neighbours report hearing a very heavy thump next door and then silence. As the head hit the floor. But thought no more of it. You just imagine some people in the adjoining thing, big, big thump and screaming. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there's two sides to this. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's all good. Turn up the wireless. <laughs> <laughs> but what to do, what to do with a corpse, Nick? Well. When you have a corpse in the house, what can you do? Oh, is that a question? Oh, I mean, if you have answers, go ahead. Experience in the matter. <laughs> 
Well, well, I think some sort of disposal might be in order. Or some sort of crazy taxidermy. <laughs> Weekend at Bronies, the Victorian yeah. era. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's simple. You just chop it up and throw it in the river. I mean, that'll do the trick. So it was that Kate dragged the body of Mrs. Thomas to the kitchen, where she began to dismember her. First, she cut off the head yep. with a razor and a meat saw. What's wrong with the axe? Go with the axe. It's worked so far. You've got you to work through. Axe, you've got to swing and right. keep chopping. She's not an axe man. She's not an executioner. I mean, really, the, ra- the, the oh, meat so, saw but, is going to work s- better. Sawing someone in, in, in pieces is much easier. It's, it's more accurate. I think we I, don't know I, how I, blunt the axe well, is. And also, I'm not entirely sure what, what accuracy she's requiring at this point. <laughs> <laughs> the woman's dead. <laughs> so. Yes, but what if she's trying to aim for the neck to get the head off, and then she just keeps hitting the chest? She's not going to aim for the head and get the foot, is she? Well, um, she might get it somewhere else. <laughs> for all we bits. know, she tried. She tried with the axe for a while, and when this is awful, <laughs> this is and not just going well. to the saw. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm, I'm going with razor and saw to get the head off, rather than you just wheel. <laughs> an axe around the house <laughs> so off goes the head with the meat saw despite nick's protestations <laughs> then she hacks off the limbs maybe she used the axe on the limbs they're easier smaller joints they are right yes as she's dismembering the torso the organs and the intestines go into the furnace to be burned nice. but the limbs and the torso minus the head she balls up in a large laundry copper pot. Ah, a good old copper pot. Uh, and it's quite apt. You've gone for a copper receptacle. Yeah, indeed it is. And twas in that that the body was boiled. Nice. So, yes, it's a lovely, lovely scene. There's a big copper pot and it's a laundry sort of size pot. So, obviously, you've got to fit in all the sheets in there. So, you can easily fit in a dismember well, What body. I'm also thinking is, like, how much Moscow Mule could you make of that? <laughs> She chucked out her experiments of going, no, cocktail hour will have That's to wait. That's a big party. That's a big party time going on there. <laughs> Fill that with ice, a few bottles of vodka, ginger beer, a ladle. Fun times are being had. Head bobbing around as garnish. <laughs> <laughs> she must have had that on her mind. My God, this would be a great place to make a Moscow meal. Oh, some cocktails, a little bit of grog. <laughs> because once the torso and the limbs are nicely boiling away on the stove, and it's a slow boil, obviously, the best thing to do is to let it simmer and head off down the pub for a few pints. Well, absolutely. (laughs) So leaves the pot bubbling away with Mrs. Thomas in it and heads off down the hole in the wall pub for a few Sunday pints. Mm, (laughs) Delicious. A few jars. She's in there for a bit. She checks the clock and then returns to the house. Uh, just checks on the stew. I was say there must be lovely aromas floating over the buildings. It is remarked sort of delightfully upon. Delightfully stew going on. <laughs> well, it is remarked upon by neighbours that they did notice a strong, unpleasant smell oh, unpleasant coming smell. from the house. But around this time would have been sort of Sunday. N- not normally the day you do laundry, but people this probably thought it was just a very, very bad laundry batch. <laughs> they were just, oh God, their sheets are awful. But yes, it was <laughs> remarked upon, but nobody did anything. Because why would you... Your house smells! <laughs> yeah, exactly. We no one did anything. Who would do anything? It's an unpleasant smell someone comes from someone's house. I'm knock on the door going, your house is very smelly. <laughs> so she strains off uh, the, bo- the, the the bones and the limbs and everything. Yeah, just uh, strains off the liquid, just puts that, you know, puts it out. And she places the remains, as many remains as possible, into a large wooden box and also a Gladstone bag. Nice, nice. We like that. Big black kind of old-fashioned doctor's Doctor openly bag. toppy bag. She shoves as many remains as she can into the wooden box and the rest go into the Gladstone bag. Except for the head and one foot, which would not fit in the box nor bag, so she disposed of those separately. Now, Kate had gone about cleaning the house after this, scrubbing away the many blood stains, <laughs> all of the flesh everywhere. All the, the axe marks in the walls. Yes. <laughs> Cleaning off, polishing the axe and getting that nice and sharp again. But acting like nothing was wrong. So Mrs. Thomas is now missing, but as we know, she goes off. She she travels. Kate is just seen tending to the house, shiftily running back and forth from the pub. She was had the foresight to save Mrs. Thomas's gold bridge work from her mouth. And mm. she pawned that for six shillings. Nice. Mm. She was already pawning the old woman's furniture. She had much bigger plans thinking how she can get rid of the entire (laughs) house and all of the furnishings inside for a much larger sum. But what's more, Mm. it is said that on one of her many trips to the pub, she offers to sell the landlord and also some of the youngsters in the area some of the best dripping they would ever have. Oh, oh no. 
They declined to buy it. Well, good. I'm glad. I'm glad of that. We're all right for dripping. And it's probably quite lucky because it is, of course, the rendered fat of Mrs. Thomas. (laughs) That's not very nice. (laughs) This is a story that becomes legend, but many people report on that she had tried to, to proffer it, though no one buys it. A couple of days later, Kate Webster is seen leaving the house with the box and the Gladstone bag and wearing one of Mrs. Thomas's finest silk dresses. She goes on to call on old neighbours of hers, people she hasn't seen for many, many years, called the Porters. And she shows up at the door, flaunting her finery, even changing her name, saying she is now called Mrs Thomas, saying that she had married and been widowed and was now a wealthy woman with a lot of property to sell. She sometimes changes her story, saying actually an aunt had bequeathed her a house in Richmond varies between whether it was her ex-husband or her aunt. People are just going, oh, okay, okay. okay yeah. but she shows up at the porter's house asking them for help to find a property broker, someone who can help her get rid of this house and all the furniture in there as quickly as possible, but insists, insists that they must discuss the particulars at the local pub. Mm. <laughs> this woman has a priority straight. I like it's it. where all business should be conducted. Yes. And in these business meetings she has, she makes frequent trips to the pub between the Porter's house and the station. I think there's two pubs, there may be more. She sort of goes on a bit of a tour. They're like, please stop going to all the pubs. What do you want to sell? <laughs> on her walks to and fro the pubs, the Gladstone bag disappears very close to the river and is mm. never seen again. On another occasion, she asks a member of the Porter family to help her with this wooden box that she is travelling with. It's on the bridge over the River Thames. When the porters have walked ahead, they hear a splash behind them and turn around and Kate, now Mrs Thomas, <laughs> has said, oh, no, the box is gone. Don't worry about it. And they walk off. <laughs> They're like, okay. I accidentally, it accidentally fell over the, over the side of the bridge. Yes, I'm lugging this massive wooden box around that I've now hurled over the side of the bridge. Don't even nice. worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's fine. While there's no trace of the Gladstone bag, which is a shame because I love a Gladstone bag, it's a good bag. Yep. It's a good bag. The box did not sink to the bottom of the river, as Kate might have hoped, but instead it washed up on the banks and was discovered around 7am the next day by a coalman, Henry Wheatley. And when he spotted the box, he thought it might have been loot from a robbery and wonders over, you see a box wash up on the Thames. Ooh, 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 let's just see what's in there. Opens it up. Oh, my God. Various body parts wrapped in brown paper. <laughs> so, of course, he reports the contents to the police. One would hope so. At the same time, a human foot is found on a rubbish heap in Twickenham. I used to live in Twickenham. Did you ever dispose of a human foot? There? I can't say I did. No. It's a lovely place, though. Aside from all the feet. Mounds and mounds of feet <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> It was difficult to leave the flat without just like feet there, oh, <laughs> kicking the feet out of the way. Bloody, there's always feet on the way to the tube. <laughs> but it becomes clear to the authorities that these have come from the same corpse and they literally have a mystery on their hands. They have a dismembered body with no head and no means to identify it. So they can tell that these remains have been boiled, but without a head, no means of identifying. Mm. They suspect that it's been used for dissection, maybe, mm. or by some mystery assailant for nefarious deeds. And those remains are later interned in um, Barnes Cemetery. And it's called the Barnes Mystery. Meantime, Kate Webster, who's having a great time wearing all of the old woman's <laughs> clothes and jewellery and dancing about the local pubs, continues to try and find someone who will buy the old woman's house from her. She enlists the help of John Church. He's of a publican and, you know, he can shift furniture. Maybe he's a little bit dodgy, but nothing untoward. And she enlists him to clear the house of furniture. But when John Church and Kate turn up at the house, the neighbour next door he feels suspicious about this and is worried mm. and manages to speak to Mr Church and members of the Porter family who have come by and they're saying look Mrs Thomas hasn't been seen for a long time and everyone starts to put two and two together going this feels a bit weird why does she have this house and is desperate to sell it at you know very cut price and they've also talked about Kate's strange wooden box and the bag that has gone missing (laughs) and the authorities are called in and they think it's enough to go and investigate the cottage and inside they find the axe the razor Uh... bloodstains and the charred remains in the furnace. So it is now clear that Kate has killed Mrs. Thomas. So obviously you have the need to get rid of everything that was in the bag, everything that was in the box, and you don't throw away the axe. <laughs> and then the knife and all that, and the, the razor and all that sort of stuff as well. Well, she's cleaned them. She's cleaned them. But she doesn't think anyone's going to go and investigate yeah. in there. And she's cleaned True. all the bloodstains up, but that, you know, you can't really clean blood spatter that well, can you? 
you're gonna find something either that or she just did a cursory wipe down the table and went, yeah i'll do i'll do <laughs> the authorities deem that kate must be found but kate has been quick she has gathered up her son and fled back to ireland by way of a coal steamer glamorous glamorous nice glamorous life but the irish authorities match scotland yard's description of her with that of the young troublemaker kate webster who was convicted of larceny and all sorts of theft and all sorts of trouble way back when mm. she is caught by the police brought back to England and taken to Richmond Police. And on the 30th of March, she is formally charged with murder. 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 Murder must fail. You can imagine this is another media sensation. This is a biggie. <laughs> oh, ho, ho. people are traveling from miles around to look at the grim cottage of death to take souvenirs from outside, pebbles they take from outside of the cottage. At the trial, Kate first accuses John Church of being the murderer, the guy that she spoke to weeks, ages later saying okay. can you come and sell the furniture and he's and she's like yes yes he did it and he's like no i have a very very solid alibi that's, <laughs> i did not know you then <laughs> you're crazy you're crazy the trial continues to be a buzz with people of all walks of life as a, as the papers report daily on the proceedings with gusto on day four the crown prince of sweden turns up to watch it oh bloody hell <laughs> <laughs> the future king the future king nice <laughs> But they listen as Kate's defence is that she denies her involvement completely, citing, and they try and cite her devotion to her son as reason enough that she wouldn't be a murderer. Okay. Son that she's mm -hmm. barely taken care of her yeah. whole life. Not oh, hugely devoted. But they do focus, the prosecution, as well as the huge mound of evidence that's against her, they do focus on her impassive cold demeanor there's lots of writings about how the setting of her eyes indicates that she's a criminal well quite right she is a female murderess you know she's she's definitely done this but a great hoo-ha is made about this woman murdering people it's absolutely sensational at the time because women and servants are docile and they would never strike their employers and suddenly ooh, ripples ripples through society there's a bonnet maker thought you'd like to hear about a bonnet maker. I, I enjoy a bonnet maker, absolutely. Uh, her name is Maria Durden. And she tells the court that Kate had visited her a week before the murder, talking about how she was going to sell property, jewellery and a house that, again, an aunt had left her, which makes people think, OK, this is premeditated. She was planning this. Oh. Is it an act of passion, act of madness, or was she planning it all along? Mm. Kate is found guilty by the jury. <sighs> is okay. about to be sentenced. When she asks if there's anything that could possibly stay in execution at this point. Would it be a pregnancy by any chance? Pregnant! <laughs> she calls out, I'm pregnant! Right. Everyone's flummoxed. The judge says in his, his 30 years he's not actually encountered any kind of objection like this. So they call upon the good old jury of matrons. Twelve good women of stature. Nice. To rule whether Kate, this is, this is important, was quick with child. <laughs> the quick with child means that you can feel the baby moving. The quickening. Excellent. So 12 women sworn in along with the surgeon and they go into a private room for an examination where they basically poke her stomach for a bit and they go, no, no signs of life. There's no quickening here, which became a point of contention. It, it does stand to reason that this method was so archaic that mm. you can't tell if someone is pregnant just by going, okay, yeah. there's a baby moving. She could have been pregnant. She was lying. Yes. She was just trying to get out of it. But no matter, it was not long before her sentence would be carried out. And the night before, Kate made a full confession. Purges herself of all of her guilt. She says it was her. She exonerates everyone that she accused in the trial. <laughs> and she was hanged on the 29th of July and buried in an unmarked grave. Mm. When she was hanged, there was a crowd waiting outside Wandsworth Prison. And when the black flag was raised over the prison walls to indicate the death sentence had been carried out, a massive cheer rang out. <laughs> Compassionate lot, Londoners. They are. They love it. <laughs> oh, yes, I love a good hanging. I like a good hanging, I just. <laughs> From the West Country, apparently. Later on, the, uh, Mrs. Thomas's possessions at Mayfield Cottages were auctioned off. Oddly enough, John Church, who was just there to kind of make a quick buck by selling the furniture, did actually get some of the items that were being auctioned, including the dead woman's pocket watch and the knife that was used apparently oh, to dismember her yeah that's a jolly souvenir the copper tank where her body was boiled was sold for five shillings oh, i'm sure that'll probably yeah we reuse that <laughs> absolutely yeah absolutely moscow and yours with a hint of body can't get that gonna waste the house was a prime spot for people taking souvenirs but it otherwise sat empty for many many years and even when it was brought back into use servants 
were very reluctant to work there because of what had happened beforehand. That's understandable, yep. And such a sensation and gruesome case that Kate Webster was, of course, added to Madame Tussauds oh, as a course. waxwork figure, alongside Dr. Crippen, William Barmer, all the others, famed as the Richmond murderess. Nice. Ta-da. Oh, very good. So I'd heard the Rich- Richmond murderess. I knew I knew the name from somewhere, but I had no idea of the story behind it. Um, so, uh... Would you like to know what happened to Mrs. Thomas's skull? Oh, oh, is it in a museum somewhere or something weird like that? Well, the pub, the former pub, the Hole in the Wall pub, yes. which was, I think, one door down. There was one house in between Mayfield Cottages where the murders happened. The pub and the building in between the cottages was bought um, up by a, a private investor. And in 2010, they were trying to renovate the pub and they dug up behind it and they found the skull. <gasps> Oh, that's exciting. Tested at University of Edinburgh. They did all sorts of tests and they revealed it was Mrs. Thomas's skull. And Kate must have buried it in the ground behind the pub before fleeing. <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that. Do you know who bought the pub and the house? I can't say I do. Sir David Attenborough. Oh, <laughs> very good. Sir David, <laughs> Sir David of Attenborough oh. did buy the base and what a discovery was made on his land. That's, oh, that's exciting. I like that. Uh, yeah. 2010, they found the skull. Ooh, very good. But that is the story of Kate Webster and Mrs. Julia Martha Thomas. Oh. Murder in Richmond. Nice. Well, not nice. Freddie Grimm, really, but uh, an <laughs> excellent story. I like that. Axe murdering and, well, sort of axe murdering and boiling. A- maybe axe boiling. murdering, dismembering, <laughs> boiling. <laughs> You've got it all, really. You've covered all bases. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were due a, dis- a nice dismembering we story. We haven't had to one for a with. while, so absolutely, no. we, were, we were overdue a dismembering. What do you think of old uh, Kate and. Uh, I mean, it's fairly cut and dried. I yeah, think. I mean, I, I think it's difficult. So, oh, no, she didn't do it. No, she did it. <laughs> it's, um... I think Mrs. Thomas, she did She did something like a kind of an Agatha christie style character who was just primed to be bumped off she doesn't seem like the most relaxed or pleasant person to work for that is true (laughs) um not entirely sure she deserved her fate no no (laughs) no and it wasn't a subtle death no indeed not Um, i can imagine growing into her as i get older just this really (laughs) pernickety old fussy person who goes around in a big hat and puts all their jewels on before they leave the house and berates the servants for not scrubbing hard enough. And has a house right next to the pub. Yeah, that, that's what that pretty much means now, really. Um. I did get a glimpse of that last summer when I was cutting back the massive overgrown hedges in your garden and your cleaner was round and you were just standing outside with a cup of tea and going, oh, it's good to have staff. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> but then he gave me gin, so it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got gin. What are you complaining about? <laughs> oh, yes. oh, dear. I'm a terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, no, no. No, you're lovely, lovely. I do like a murderous servant story. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're quite creepy behind closed doors of servants sort of going mad and turning on their employers. It will be good to yell the butler did it at some point. <laughs> Well, usually the butler's just shagged people, pointing to the baby. The butler did it. The butler did it. <laughs> yeah, any opportunity to say that, I'd be happy. Yes. Well, what do you think, guys? Do you know the story of the Richmond murderess? Have you heard of the story? Uh, what do you think of a good, uh, you know, clubbing your employer on the head with an axe and then dismembering their body? Would you use the same methods or <laughs> would you vary it up? Will you ever look at copper pots again? Will you be able to make the Moscow mule after hearing that story? But we think you should. I think you absolutely you should. You should, most certainly. Do you have copper pots for laundry or for cocktails? Tell us what you think. Keep sharing tips for new grim stories that we can cover in season two. Anything eccentric and crazy, we'd love to hear about it. We've got some big plans. Oh, there's some good ones on the way. <laughs> Exciting times. So as before, we said, check out our Patreon. Yours for but $5 a month. It's very exciting lots of new episodes on there behind the scenes bonus content is very exclusive very fancy check it out and on friday we will have well i said the recipe for the moscow mule you all know how to make a moscow mule uh, but it'll be out there <laughs> just in case copper mug optional if you've got one go for it if you don't chuck it in a tumbler it's be equally delicious also good with a pewter tankard maybe pewter tankard absolutely bowl <laughs> wine glass <laughs> bucket Mug. Mug. Whatever you've got, really. If you put it in a mug and then you can just get through your meetings on Friday, yeah. pretending it's coffee. It's coffee. Mm-hmm. I mean, because this, this, this has got a handle to it. So change it to just a mug. No one would know. Glorious. No one will ever know. 
And keep your eyes peeled on social media in the next few days because we do have a rather special giveaway that we're going to be launching Ooh, very, very soon. Exciting. exciting things, exciting things to win. Yes. And if you haven't already, if you are new to the show or you haven't had time, please do leave us a review on Apple iTunes. Thank you to everyone who has left reviews so far. By all means, send us screenshots of them. But please do leave us reviews wherever you listen to the podcast because it makes such a difference to us and it really helps us get up the ratings and helps more people discover us. Yes, because did you know, this week we are true crime 19, 19th <gasps> in true crime in Qatar. No. Oh, oh. we are hot stuff in Qatar. You're telling me we are top 20 in Qatar. <laughs> I mean, how the... I mean, that's quite impressive. How? Really. I have no idea how. How? But so, so the stat things tell me. Oh, God, in Qatar. They, 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 oh, should they be listening to us? I don't know. <laughs> Well, look, if you want to get us higher up the ranks in Qatar. <laughs> or wherever you are. <laughs> wherever you are, you've got to get in there and leave the reviews. Five star reviews, please. If you do have feedback, we're happy to have constructive feedback. Please just send it to us in the messages. Do leave a review if you can, if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.